All right. So, so investing is something that I've done for a long time, and I'm sure all of you have put in a, a substantial amount of time. Um, I'm 56. It seems like you know where our ages vary a little bit, uh, but it's really a long-term you know journey, and it starts somewhere. And this workshop was really meant to be a place where you could bring up a topic that we can study, talk about, and work on, and to get kind of get juices flowing. I'll uh, share my screen. And, uh, you know, as you get going as an investor, you know, you want to get your head around certain things, right? The, the longer the horizon you have, the more you're going to be able to compound your, your returns. You know, so the power of compounding is really uh, important to keep in mind. We can go over that. I'm just kind of putting topics out there to see if, if somebody came here with a topic, I'd be happy to hear it. Or if you guys want to pick out a topic or two from here, we can talk about it. But continuing on this list, uh, understanding risk, you know, what are the risks within stocks? You know, we, we have high growth stocks, we have small cap stocks, we have large cap stocks, you know, really getting our heads around risk. Diversification, asset allocation, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a topic that I think is a really good topic to talk about because, you know, I've read multiple books and um, there's a lot to be said in that area. Keeping your costs low, if you're an ETF investor, keep that in mind. And then investing strategies, long-term value investing, dividend investing, that type of, of, of uh, strategy. You know, which one do you feel like, hey, I want to take that on? That's who, that's the type of investor I want to be. And it doesn't mean you're that investor forever. Like a long time ago, I was purely like growth, excited about super high growth companies. Now that I'm 56, I'm like, okay, I still like growth companies, but I really like keeping a good part of my portfolio really low risk. Because if I need that money in the next five years, I want to make sure it's there. And of course, I still have some growth stocks, but not not as many. Like when I was 25, I was like, I don't really. I just want to grow my grow my money. I don't have a lot, so I want to grow it as fast as I can. Now that I have a substantial amount, then I want to preserve some of it, and I want some of it to produce a good return. So it doesn't mean you're going to be stuck with that that particular uh, type of investing forever. It should evolve as your needs evolve, as your wealth becomes larger. You know, you want to protect some of it. Okay. And then uh, kind of getting the mentality of being an owner versus a lender or, uh, or a, a stock trader in an investment. I think that's interesting to talk about. So let me ask you guys, is there a topic you guys came to the call wanting to talk about? Or So Yoda, you have a question. I have a pretty specific question regarding uh, DCF, discounted cash flows. Yeah, this is, let me read your whole comment. What are your thoughts on using weighted average cost of capital or just picking a discount rate? Yeah, okay. I can definitely uh, put that, we can cover that. Because um, I do have something to say there. And um, we can cover it. So anything else before we get into like valuations and weighted average cost of capital, which is a very specific topic, it's a good one. It just kind of goes straight to valuing stocks. All right, go for it, Tomas. Yeah, so um, I want to understand the power of compounding, but I don't know if it applies the same way with dividend stocks, the the growth uh, dividend stocks against the the earnings of a company. You know, the compounding mm -hmm. earnings. Sure. So we can let's talk about compounding, and I'll answer your question about the dividend rate and so forth. And how does that affect the compounding of your investment? Good stuff. Okay, we're off to the races with two. Anything else? And of course, if you think of something a little later, you can always bring it up. But uh, anything else before we get we get rolling? Okay, so I'll get started with the power of compounding. And there's a, a rule of 72 that I was taught a long time ago. So, Tomas, have you heard of the law of, or the rule of 72? No, no, I don't know it. Okay. So I'm glad that you're going to hear it because I was in college a long time ago, like early 90s, and I heard this rule. So the rule of 72 basically means that if you take 72 and you divide it by your rate of return, 
Let's keep it. Let's keep it. If your rate of return is um, okay, so if your rate of return is let's say seven point two percent, you you would you would divide seventy two by seven point two percent and you get ten. You with me? Yes, I'm following. Okay, let me and yeah, I think I can still carry on. So that means that every ten years, that investment will double in value. So if you take a thousand dollars, you earn seven point two percent interest. In 10 years, that thousand dollars would be worth two thousand dollars. Okay. Now, let's say we earned 20% rate of return. Okay. That means in three and a half years, because 72 divided by 20 is about three and a half. Are you with me on that math? In yes. three and a half years, you would double your money with a 20% rate of return. So you take your thousand dollars, you earn 20%. In three years, three and a half years, you have two thousand dollars. And the power of compounding is. The more times you can double that thousand dollars, you're gonna go about from a thousand to two thousand to four thousand to eight thousand to sixteen thousand over the course of fifteen to twenty years. So you went from a thousand up to sixteen thousand, sixteen times your original investment over the course of fifteen to twenty years. That's the power of compounding. So you want to stay invested, you want to keep your investment in in the market or in real estate or in bonds and so forth. It really shows up, compounding shows up in real estate because people don't move all that often. They buy a house, they live in it for 20 years, they make their mortgage payments. Real estate only goes up like in the United States, on average, three to 5%. Recently, it's been a little higher. So you think about it and you go, whoa, that's not very quick. But if you're compounding at 5%, you know, over 20, 30 years, you've tripled or quadrupled the original price of the home. So if you bought a home for 200,000, you show up or you wake up 25 years later and it's worth a million dollars. And people are like, wow, that was a great investment. Yes, because you let it compound. So the power of compounding, you give it time and then you really accelerate your returns on the tail end of that curve. Mr. Enkiter, you had a question? Yes. So, you know, there are various types of investors. There are the young ones that can be aggressive and can aim for high rate of return. Is there like guidelines of, or formula, if I can use this word, probably it's not a good word, but you know what I mean? Like what what should aim like someone which is a retiree? Okay. So that's uh -huh. a very good question. Okay. So I'm going to show a chart and hopefully this chart. Yeah. You guys can see this chart, right? So how can I make this bigger? Um, so can you guys see this chart clearly? Yeah, I can see it. And let me try to make it bigger. And and I'm going to answer your question, Ms. Uh, and Kyder. Um And let me open up. Okay, so this is going to be a little more visible, right? Okay, so you can see that on a differing rate of return, when we look at when we look at the rate of return, as it goes up, these curves, the value of your investment will go up over time. Okay. Now, when you're young and you're like, hey, I'm going to invest for 20, 30 years, I would like, I'm going to speak from the position of as a dad, right? I have a 24-year-old son, I have a 20-year-old son. They both started investing already. One of them is very passive. The other one is very active. The younger one is very active investor. And I want them both to be in high growth because if you can have a high rate of return, on average, you're going to have a higher rate of return when you go into uh, growth stocks and sectors that are expanding. A sector is like technology. Within technology, that sector has industries like semiconductors, which have been red hot, software, uh, hardware companies, okay? Now, if you achieve a 20% rate of return, as I showed, you're going to double your money every three and a half years. So when you're young and you have very little, let's say you have $5,000 or $10,000, you want a high rate of return so you could keep doubling that amount. And as you work, you can continue to contribute money into that fund so you can have more capital to work with. As you get older, now to your question, Ankiter, and you've made, you've amassed, you know, 
enough money to take care of yourself, take care of your spouse or your loved ones. You've amassed enough money to buy a second home, take trips around the world and so forth. That's when you begin to, uh, or, or what I'm doing and what is recommended when it's a good idea is take a portion of your portfolio and put it into lower risk. You only have to get wealthy once. You don't want to bet it all like on high growth because high growth certain years will be negative. Like 2022, the NASDAQ was down like 35, 36%. So if you had your entire portfolio in NASDAQ growth stocks, you could have lost a third of, of the value of your wealth. Was, you know, it's not a good idea. Once you've amassed it and you don't have a lot more time that you want to invest, you put some or a good part of your uh, portfolio into low risk. That's a good idea. There's also people that are uh, wealthy, you know, fairly young. Maybe they're a professional athlete or they won the lottery or a relative left them a, a very big um, uh, fortune in, in through their inheritance. And they, they have this, this, this amount. Professional money managers will tell those folks, you only have to get wealthy once. And they put them in a good part of uh, safe investments. But for an investor like myself that I started with pretty much nothing and built it all, I was in growth stocks in my 20s and 30s. I was still in growth stocks in my 40s. There was one mistake I made when I was young is the, uh, the textbooks and the advice that was generally given was that you should always have some kind of balance between stocks and bonds. And I followed it. I wish I wouldn't have bought bonds when I was in my 20s and in my 30s. Um, looking back, I'm like, I should have just been completely into growth. I didn't need the money. It would have grown faster. And um, I would have made a better return when I was young, 20, 30. Maybe when I got to 40, okay, let's start putting some money into other places. By the time I got to 40, I had a pretty good, you know, level of wealth savings. But between the age of 40 and 50, my overall savings and wealth went up five times. That's the compounding is it may seem, and I'm gonna get to your question, Yoda, you know, it may seem when you're young that God, man, this is taking forever. I'm going, I had like 5,000, you know, 10 years ago, I've only got 75,000. I see other investors that have a million dollars, $5 million, $10 million. You know, this is taking a while. Just keep in mind that the compounding, once you get to like year 20, it really starts to go up very fast. And between 20 and 30, look out. It's going to really impress you. Uh, Yoda, you, you have a question? Yeah, I just had like a comment on uh, kind of like this compounding concept as well, right? So like especially um, in relation to retirement accounts, um, because I did think about this in terms of tax, right? So uh, compounding, like in my mind, like really gets impacted by tax rates. Because every year you're paying tax and you basically lose a proportion of that percentage that you're dividing by 72, right? So if you're making like 10% uh, returns, but you're paying 30% tax, you're actually only making a 7% returns when you do that division. So um, that also applies like dividends, right? And so like one thing I was thinking about is, so dividends, because they're paid annually, it has more value in like a retirement account where you don't have to pay taxes versus a regular account. And I wanted to like hear your thoughts on kind of like, does that... Is that a proper way to think about this compounding concept when you think about it in terms of the value of like dividend stocks versus non-dividend stocks and growth stocks, right? Yeah, good question. So, so you bring up an important um, factor, which is, so if you, and this is all in the US, right, Tomas, you're in Argentina. So I don't know if this is the same where you're at from a tax perspective, but here, let's say if you bought Meta stock and you bought it and you spent, you invested $10,000 and now that's worth $50,000, but you never sold one share, you pay no tax, none, okay? Now, Meta, I think now pays a dividend. And when they pay you a dividend here in the United States, you get taxed on the dividend, okay? Now, I'm gonna take it in two phases, okay? You gotta bear with me. I just wanna put it out there first and then go into retirement accounts. So when we talk about compounding and you brought up the topic, Tomas, of dividend stocks, high level, it's, it's my opinion that dividend stocks are not good for young investors that have a long, investing horizon because you get taxed if you know just if you're in a brokerage account it's after tax money and you're getting paid a dividend you're paying taxes ordinary income taxes on that dividend i would prefer like again back to one of my sons i would prefer they buy a stock that goes up in value very quickly or a set of stocks 
that go up in value, never pay a dividend, and then they wake up in 20 years and they have 500,000, a million dollars sitting there uh, from a portfolio that just kept growing. Okay. So dividends could be a bad thing for compounding because of tax. Okay. Now, what Yoda is bringing up is probably a very good idea to consider. If you have pre tax money going to your 401k or money going into an IRA, a Roth IRA, where in a 401k, you put pre-tax money. You're not going to get taxed on that now. You'll get taxed on it when you withdraw it. Roth, once you put the capital in, you don't get taxed anymore when you withdraw it. So dividend investing inside of a 401k could be lucrative, especially if you get into some of these higher paying dividend stocks like a Ternium or a um, high yield bond. I have this bond down in Mexico, and it really is going to have a yield of 16 18% for me. That's inside of a free tax account where I don't have to pay tax now. I'll have to pay it when I withdraw it. But not for now, I could just let it compound. So compounding will happen inside of a 401k, inside of an IRA, inside of a savings account that the government says, if you put money away for your retirement in there, we're not going to tax you. We're not even going to tax your income if that income is going to go into that savings account that is, is focused on your retirement. There's rules that you can't withdraw the money in the U.S. until you're 59 and a half. Then you can withdraw it without penalty. There's some there's some exceptions, like if you're going to buy a home, um, you're allowed to withdraw like $50,000. You're allowed to take loans against it. And there's hardship rules too, that if, if you can prove hardship, in some situations, you're allowed to pull your money, pay tax, but not pay the penalty. So that's a, that's a good point to make on compounding. But I know that... I know speaking for myself, when I was 25, I understood compounding, but I didn't, it wasn't kind of like, I didn't believe it hundred percent. I'm like, okay, well, I'll see when I get there. <laughs> and uh, the compounding actually ended up being better than I thought it was going to be, especially in real estate. Real estate really just shot up. Um, and some, a, a good part of my portfolio, like my portfolio went from being like around 200,000 up to maybe 500,000 from the ages of like 30 to 40. And then from 40 to 50, it went like 5X. It just really grew. And a, a big part of it was I just, I never touched the money. The money just kept growing and I kept adding to it. And I added just, uh, you know, in my book, 10% or more. I would always add 10% minimum. I'd make a lot of money from working. I put some extra in there and that really ended up uh, being a, a good winning recipe. So, so that's a very good topic of, you know, focusing on compounding and really seeing, you know, the long-term payoff, which is you'll have, you'll amass a very good fortune if you stay invested. Okay. Um, Tomas, does that handle the topic well? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I have one more question. Um, how can I know if a company is going to compound, a company that does not pay dividends, mm -hmm. how can I know if it's going to compound? You know, what should I look? The earnings, the revenue? Okay, so very good question. So I'm going to show you an, a very, very extreme example. Okay. So NVIDIA, you've heard of this company, right? Um, so at the beginning of 2023, you said to yourself, I really believe in NVIDIA which I wish I would have told myself that. And you put $10,000 in NVIDIA in 2023. You can see my screen, correct? Yeah. And this stock compounded very quickly. And this proves that the higher the rate of return, the faster you'll double, triple, quadruple your money. In less than two years, you took that $10,000 and you turned it into $84,000. Okay. So this is an extreme and very clear sign that this stock is going to come compound your money. It's going to compound your wealth. Okay. Now let's look at a less extreme example. I'm going to look at a company that I looked at recently and um, they had a tough week. So let's show them a little love. So here's United Healthcare. This is a boring company. This is health insurance, right? Oh man, it's boring. Okay. Well, sometimes boring is okay because here you see this number here. 132%. That means that over five years, 
if I put $10,000 in at the beginning of that term, when I wake up five years later, I made $13,217 of profit on top of my 10,000. So now I doubled my 10,000 and the balance is $23,217. So I just compounded my stock in United Healthcare. So you don't have to be in NVIDIA to compound. You can be in you know regular boring stocks like United Healthcare, JP Morgan, Coca-Cola. You know, they compound at a slower rate, but they're also less risky. They're very known, very common knowledge on these stocks. Okay. So how would you know that a company is going to compound for you? Is you study. So first, you know, you look at a five-year chart to have a good example, but it doesn't mean that you know, United Healthcare is going to continue to go up and to the right. You've got to do your homework to determine. I still believe that United Healthcare is going to continue to go up and to the right. Um, an example that I'm going to think of is, you know, uh, Netflix was a, a company that um, announced this week and they had a very, very good week. Over the last five years, see, this, this was an opportunity, okay? to then invest in a stock that had compounded before. You see, I went from 300 up to 700. Investors that bought here doubled their money. Then the market decided, you know, we're gonna discount the heck out of Netflix. We don't believe in it. I didn't agree with the market. I thought the market's nuts. It's out of its mind because Netflix is the leader. It's the really good company, so I bought. And then from here to here, it went up 322%. So very quickly, this stock compounded three times. I didn't make this whole amount. I ended up selling like here, somewhere along the way. I sold. I sold it at the end of 2023. I still made a very good rate of return. But th these are the kind of stocks that, as a young person, I would see. I would, I would recommend. Look, try to find some of these. Try to find. You know, if you're fortunate to find the next Nvidia, the Apple when it was, you know, less expensive. Right now, it's really expensive. Microsoft when it was much less expensive. Google Alphabet and so forth. You know, companies like Uber to me excite me because Uber is a young company. When you look at Uber and you see this chart, it doesn't make it easy on investors, right? Remember we saw United Healthcare just a minute ago and it was kind of up and to the right, boring, smooth. Well, investors like that. Now there's investors that are looking for growth that can appreciate a company like Uber that had a tough time as a stock from 2021 down to 2022. It sold off 64%. But then it just picked up and went really high, 254. And I think that Uber is going to continue to go up in value because it's a new industry, ride sharing, robo taxi, food delivery. Those things are going to continue to expand and Uber is expanding around the world. So it has a lot of organic growth ahead of it. So growth companies will help us expand or, or compound our wealth. All the money you have saved up, we want it in companies that are going to go up in value. Some of these companies are going to give up value from time to time, but we need to know that through diversification, meaning you don't put all your money in Uber, you put your money in a couple of companies that you really believe in. For me, it's like Uber, Airbnb, Robinhood, Coinbase. Now, are they all going to do well? No. Some of them are going to be crash and burn scenarios. Um, but as long as like seven or eight of them do really well, and they do this, this is this will more than pay for some of those losers. And you'll make more money and you'll grow your wealth much faster in growth stocks. Dividend stocks are good for older investors that want that income and they kind of already made their money. They don't want to take a lot of risks. They don't want to see this type of downturn. So they buy, so they buy into dividend stocks because they don't want to see this kind of downturn. I imagine. I don't like seeing that kind of downturn. But um I still have a good part of my portfolio in growth, but I have a good part of it in safe, safe assets. So does that help, Tomas? You're, yes, you're, asking, yes, very, you're asking very good questions. And I encourage everybody, keep asking questions. Keep, keep challenging yourself. Keep challenging, not necessarily challenging, but keep, keep talking to your community because that's how I learn. And I've gotten really good tips on how to invest. And I would say knowledge. I would say I've gotten good knowledge and wisdom from other investors, but it only happens is you, if you're willing to be engaged, if you're willing to ask questions like you're asking, be in the conversation. Mr. N. Kiter. Yeah, I have a question, Victor. So you are uh, saying or telling about yourself that uh, art is in, in growth. So can you 
give example of, uh, I mean, I think that we know, generally speaking, some of your holding, maybe all of them, because, you know, you are sharing it. Which which of them for you is a growth stock and and why is it risky? Sure. I mean, because you know you know that I'm following you daily, and even the growth, there is a very good explanation behind. Okay. Me personally, doesn't necessarily agree with each one of them, but that's not the point. I mean, but for you, you have a very good thesis and explanation. So why? What is the risk in this growth stock? It's, it's it already there is no risk. Sure. Okay. So I'm going to show you an example that's really high risk, high reward. Okay. This is a stock that I'm probably going to buy, and I'll tell you why. Does that that chart looks pretty bloody, doesn't it? Oh man. Yeah, yeah. I, I missed that this stock. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. It's been sold off ninety eight point five percent. And Tomas, are you familiar with Chegg? You guys familiar with Chegg? No, no. I don't. I know you talk about it, but I, I can't recall what so, the company was about. In the U.S., the company provides tutoring services for college and high school students that are studying especially difficult courses they can get online assistance to take courses and you know the curriculum is pretty tough to get through high school if you have advanced classes as well as college so in the heyday when during covid they were really popular and even before covid they were quite popular right there was a 34 dollars stock but the companies really sold off because there's a threat that ai is going to replace them all together and the big boom of covid is gone well i'm answering in kiter's question which is what does a high risk stock look like that I would entertain? So not a big part of my assets would be with companies like this that I believe there's a good chance, and I could be wrong, that if I buy like, let's say $10,000 a Chegg, that it could go up 5X in the next two years. I believe there's a chance. There's also a chance it could go down to zero. <laughs> I don't think so. Because when you study their financials, they still turn free cash flow. They, start, they still make profit. So it's very hard to go bankrupt when you have a good balance sheet, which they do, they generate free cash flow, which they do. Are they going to become less and less relevant? Yes, but they're they're close to zero, right? So I don't need Chegg to go back to their free COVID stock price of thirty-two dollars a share. I just need them to get to one third of that, which is ten dollars per share, and I multiplied my money times eight. You guys with me? So that's a high risk stock. That is a high risk stock. That's a story around a high risk stock. If this thing works. It could be, I mean, the the crazy, crazy example recently is, um, have you guys followed this symbol? Have you guys followed this stock? Right Minds Biosciences? You guys have followed this to some extent, right? Investors have multiplied their money times 42 <laughs> in one week. <laughs> it's insane how fast this thing has gone up. This is a short squeeze. This is super, super, like, I would never invest in something like this. Now, uh, back to Chegg. I've studied this company. I think the risk is worth the reward. Um, thinking about it, I'm probably going to do it, but um, haven't done it yet. I'm waiting until after the election, kind of get that noise out of the way, and then we'll go from there. That's an example of high risk, Enkiter. Another high risk was Zim, right? Here's a company that I went in. I got out. This, this stock's been all over the place. Up. Oh, down over the last year, just volatility. See that volatility? This is a high risk stock, but it did reward. If you if you get in at the right times and you get out at the right times, it'll reward you. So two examples of high risk. Okay. All right. So I think uh we covered compounding. That's a very good topic. And uh I don't know what the age you know the ages of the investors on on this call are, but uh, I imagine some of us have already seen that acceleration and it's hard to kind of notice it unless you really do go back and go how much did i have you know 20 years ago and how much did i have today and you see that whoa it really did follow this this really nice chart of um the compounding going up and to the right really really fast okay what i'm hoping to do is um get to a point where i'm going to live off my portfolio and it's going to continue to go up in value if you follow me, like I'll be able to withdraw from the portfolio, but it still gains value year after year without any more capital being put into it. I'm not there yet, close, but um, that's what I'm trying to do. That's the outcome I want. I want my portfolio to pay for everything and I want to leave my sons a fair amount, each each one of my two sons. Mr. Ed Kiter. 
Yeah, a lot of questions today, but you, you're saying leave off uh, your portfolio, but uh, I mean, part of our portfolio is real estate. It's even even social security. So mm -hmm. are, aren't those part of what you are considering as living, uh, living off this, or you are referring, you want to live only off the, the portfolio? And in that case, what about the income from the real estate? Yeah. So you're asking a question that I, I'm going to answer on this call. Or you're bringing up a topic that I think is a good one, which is retirement and early retirement. And I have, see this tab here? Now, uh, I don't want to show it because it kind of reveals too much private information. But I have this model on the member uh, folder that I shared with you guys. And I'm going to open that guy up when I cover this topic in maybe 15 minutes after I handle Yuda's question. And then we're going to talk about that because you bring up good points. And then I can answer all the questions you just, you just brought up, okay? All right, so a question was asked. Let's talk about weighted average cost of capital. Okay, so we're we're working with, um, let me find a company that we all know. Okay, we all know Chevron, okay? You guys with me? Um, and Chevron is a very known company, good market cap, oil and gas. They've been around for more than 100 years. Uh, Really, really well-known company. So if I go to, uh, let's say I go to Simply Wall Street and I were to go and ask for CBX, it would give me a weighted average cost of capital and you could also calculate it. And let me see if they have it. I don't think I'm gonna get it very quickly, but. And I am, so here's the formula for weighted average cost capital. You can go to websites and it'll give you a weighted average cost capital. And what I would say about weighted average cost capital is that it's a little bit too much of a black box. And I think it's good to look at it just as a reference point. But your question earlier, Yuda, was do I strictly keep to the weighted average cost capital that's assigned to a company or do I make my own decision and it's the latter? I make my own decision and I look at what are interest rates doing right now. They're going down. I look at the balance sheet for Chevron. I make sure that the balance sheet doesn't have too much debt and they have a very good, you know, debt to EBITDA ratio. They have a fair amount of cash. They keep paying dividends. They keep buying back shares. So it has a healthy balance sheet. So with Chevron, I'm going with an 8%. Some companies have a seven, seven and a half percent. Companies like Microsoft might be a seven because that's super high quality. Those guys are making money like nobody's business. Chevron's kind of a, a good company, but not a superb company like Microsoft, Apple, Johnson & Johnson. Those businesses have very predictable revenues, super strong balance sheets. Chevron, on the other hand, as we've experienced, when oil prices come down, they their revenues go down, their profits go down. If oil, let's say oil went down to $50 per barrel, Chevron would be hurting. They'd be laying people off. They would be hurting. So it's a higher risk company than a Microsoft. That's probably not going to happen when we get to $50 per barrel oil. So I make the final decision and I use weighted average cost capital as just a reference point. Okay, that's what, you know, mathematically, you know, some people would put as, or I would say the calculation for Chevron is this particular weighted average cost capital. But it's my decision because I'm comparing investing in, Chevron versus investing it in Microsoft versus investing in somebody else. And I like to treat this as this is the rate of return that I want on this stock based on the risk that I am understanding in this stock. So it's my decision is the, is the answer to that. Yuda, does that give you kind of like the information you were looking for? Yeah. So like I think your explanation of discount rate is also kind of how I think about it. I understand like that's basically the risk I'm willing to take and like what I'm going to get you know, return wise. And what I was like uncertain about is some of the other people I've seen, like they use this weighted average cost of capital, which is like a pretty difficult to follow calculation. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to understand like conceptually, why is weighted average cost of capital used in those cases? So I'm gonna try to answer the latter question, uh -huh. but I'm gonna point something out first. Okay, so this is an oil company, Chevron, okay? This is an oil company, Petróleo Bra Brasileiro. This is an oil company in Brazil. 
This is a good company. But look at the discount rate, 11% versus eight. Because I'm in the United States, I'm putting more risk on myself as an investor because I'm going and investing way down in Brazil. I don't, I don't know this company really well. I can go to a Chevron gas station right now. It's five minutes away, 10 minutes away. I can see how they operate. They're somewhat of a regular company in the news feed that I get. So my comfort level is much higher with Chevron. Same industry, comfort level is different. I want a higher rate of return. So I think we're agreeing on that logic, right? Yes. Perfect. So now let's talk about weighted average cost of capital. And the one thing that I would com I would say, the reason I don't adopt weighted average cost of capital blindly is that it's a black box. And the black box meaning that you have this arithmetic that takes in their cost of capital, certain metrics and balances in their spreadsheet, but it's too much of a black box. It leaves the qualitative aspects of that company off the table. Like I just explained Chegg, right? Mm -hmm. And qualitatively, I think what, I, what I'm saying kind of makes sense. Hey, you know, are students still gonna need tutoring services? Yes, are they gonna need that knowledge? Yes, uh, are a good portion of students still gonna need Chegg? Yeah, so if, if weighted average cost of capital, and it would probably be low on Chegg, by the way, because their balance sheet's really good, gave me a number, it's just an arithmetic number, it's a quantitative number, without any qualitative influence. And that's what I'm trying to put into my discount rate is, I actually like meta for a while, had a very high weighted average cost of capital. I'm like, I don't know what that black box is spitting out and why, but I'm using a different discount rate on meta. I, I really believe in the company. I see, thank you. Um, maybe, maybe just one quick follow up is, do professional investors tend to use weighted average cost of capital in their DCF models? I think so. I think they they treat it like I do, which is, you want it like, so I think they, they use it as a reference point as well, but they still make the final decision. Like Warren Buffett makes some of these deals, right? Like he got out of Paramount, but he started buying into another company. And some of these companies, I just kind of like, um, was it uh, Chug Insurance, right? You remember that Warren Buffett started buying into Chug like three, four months ago. And if you look at Chug, you're like, okay, it's an insurance company. And you look at the metrics and, you know, progressive look better, but he started buying into it. So I think he is, you know, putting his qualitative spin on Chug and making a decision. So the, the qualitative is always going to be based on your, your experience. And, and keep this in mind, you should pick industries that you really can, can master and really get your hands around. Like professionally, I've worked in the software industry and I've worked in technology. You show me a software company, I could go backwards and front, left to right. I can understand that business very quickly. I can understand subscription models very quickly. Um, I've worked in certain industries and I really get my hands around those types of companies. Now, what um, a lot of those knowledge points are an advantage and a lot of those are qualitative, right? Like when you look at Adobe, they're number one in their market space. Their products are used for a lot of creative aspects of our digital world now. Um, Firefly looks pretty interesting. You know, so from a top performing software company whose products are most desirable, that's a qualitative process of establishing that narrative. There, it's very hard to put that in numbers. So that's why um, I think we need to marry the two sides is understand an industry, pick industries that you can really master, really get to know, really understand. So that way you can bring the qualitative advantage that you can bring and then look at the numbers and make sure the numbers are telling you this is a good company. And mathematically, there's a chance this is discounted and it's a good time to buy it. Yeah, thank you. That helps a lot. Yeah, good question. Okay, so we're humming along. We covered weighted average cost of capital. And now I wanted to get to Enkiter's question of, well, is it the whole portfolio uh, what do, we, what do you refer to as your whole portfolio as you go into retirement? And let me get to, so here's the retirement model. Okay, so you guys can see my screen, correct? Yes. Perfect, okay. So these are make-believe numbers. Yes. And, and I, I removed my stuff because again, it's too private. Some of my relatives watch the channel and I just, I don't wanna be, I'm going to a party later today for one of my cousins and I would hate for them to be like, oh, so you, 
you got this kind of liquid assets and I'd be like, no, I don't want them to know. So, uh, but this form is pretty much what I use to uh, forecast my retirement. So over here, all my liquid assets, right? You got stuff, you know, coming in from a portfolio of stocks and, you know, savings accounts. Then you have age, right? And then back to you and Kiter, I do put in social security, right? So that's going to be a cash flow that goes here. And I would put it in at the right time. Like what year am I going to start withdrawing, uh, taking social security? So I put all my positive, the, the positive uh, return on the portfolio is here. This is increases in value, dividends and interest, income from real estate properties. That's an aspect to my overall portfolio. Uh, any kind of pensions are out there. And then social security is going to come into the picture. And then withdrawals. So this is how much I'm going to withdraw. And I've created these buckets. Um, and I'll come back and comment on retirement tools. So this is uh, withdrawals, you know, like, how much money I'm going to pull out. And these are make believe numbers. I live in California. There's no way you can live on money in California. But uh, health insurance, right? You, you can get Medicare, but you can um, pay for supplemental as well. Emergency fund. And then this is the net decrease to my overall fund and then percentage increase. My model, I, I played on with it this morning and I, um, I'm going to run out of money when I'm 96. <laughs> and what I've done is I've taken our real estate assets and basically will not touch them um, or, or, and, and we're, we're going to give that to our sons. And that's, that's a good, that's a fair amount to give to our sons, each one. And we're just going to live off of this section. Um, one thing I wanted to say about retirement tools is, so I, I've hired like money advisors and, and I've gone through the process with some retirement experts. I'm 56. I'm thinking of retirement, retiring early and stopping, you know, not working anymore. And I go through it and they have these tools that, that have a very nice user experience. But again, it's a black box in some areas. Like it, it asks some general questions, lifestyle questions and stuff. And then it spits out a number. Oh, you're in good shape. Oh, you know, this, that, and the other. And I think that's good for the average person. But I really get to the, to the raw numbers and really understand, you know, this is what I'm going to put into my model and, and then manage to it. Because it shouldn't be a, I'm going to make a decision to retire. I retired today. And then, okay, I don't have to think about it anymore. No, I would continue to think about it because what if I'm making more money as a return than I had expected? And great, my portfolio keeps growing. Okay, great. Maybe I could relax and take an extra vacation with my wife. Great. Or, oh no, I'm not making as much. It's a bear market. It's been a bear market for three, four years. Okay, we got to tighten the belt. No fancy trip this year. We, we got we to gotta watch our resources. So that type of, anal that type of management of my return and my spend is going to take uh, place in my retirement. So this is available to you uh, as an example, and Kiter, if you want to take a look at it. So I think that goes into kind of like the piece that you were talking about earlier, right, and Kiter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I do. Yeah. And I, I created this again. I, I met with like three retirement specialists because I was like, okay, I went to the first one. It was like too simple. I was like, okay, well, thank you. And they made me think about a few things. I think every meeting I learned something. Then I went to another one and he was a lot better, but he wanted to take over all my assets and manage them. I'm like, well, there could be a 1% management fee. I'm like, no, nah, no, thanks. Uh, and then the third one was also helpful. Uh, and my broker actually gave it to me, gave me a, a time with their experts. And we went over their their models, good. Then I showed them my model and they go, yeah, you're you're, you're fine using your own model. And um, I'm going to continue to meet with my broker. They have, um, they give me, uh, benefits since I have a balance with them. So I in-person meeting with them, I, I go with my spouse because my lovely wife, she's not into the investing game. I am, but I want her to be in those meetings because there may come a time when she's going to go in there alone. If you know what I mean? If I decide to check out, she needs to go in and administer these assets and I've given her a playbook of what to do. Uh, but uh, that's my routine is once a year, go in, talk to a broker, just have the conversation, see if they have any good ideas. Taxes usually come up, which is really good because that's they come up with good ideas to avoid taxes. Go ahead, Brad. So as you get closer to retiring, are you going to take your growth stocks and convert them into more dividend paying stocks? Or are you just going to draw down your growth stocks? I think the yeah. latter. I think the latter. Um, if I can't see myself selling Meta, Google Alphabet, Uber, 
And the reason for it, right, Brad, is I'm way better off if Meta keeps doing what they're doing, if Uber keeps doing what they're doing, if Robin keep, keeps doing what they're doing. What if Robinhood's worth five or 10 times more money in 10 years, right? Um, I'll just I'll just sell a few shares along the way. I'll just keep selling shares. Now, keep in mind, I've put a bond ladder together where that bond ladder will pay for all my living expenses for five years. And I'd like to keep that bond ladder active for the rest of my life. And the reason for it is peace of mind. If we get into a bear market, those bonds are going to look beautiful. <laughs> They're going to be sitting there. And I think I could show you my bond ladder. Have you ever seen my bond ladder, uh, Brad? Uh, I don't think so. All right. So this is a little ugly to look at, but has a lot of information. So a bond ladder, basically, uh, I think 2025 is a good year to get my head around, right? So this is all the bonds that are going to mature in 2025. And in 2025, these bonds will mature and they will return $102,500 in my account. In the meantime, it's going to earn a yield, both in appreciation and in a paid coupon rate. These are bonds. Okay, perfect. So what I've done is I've staggered bonds with maturities for the next five years. So there's year two, here's year three, here's year four. Okay. So the intent here is if we got into a three-year bear market, I got my living expenses handled. So I have enough time to adjust and say, okay, is there a great opportunity to buy more growth stocks? Or you know what? Maybe I do want to go into more value-oriented stocks. It gives me, I can figure things out over five years. I'm very confident I can do that. I can probably figure things out in two years. But just to play it super safe, I put five years of living expenses into bonds, take that off the table. Okay. And that gives me the, the comfort level to get into my, some of these more gross oriented stocks. And that's my decision. That's my approach. It's, I'm not saying that's the right approach to everybody. I'm just saying this is how I manage risk and this is how I diversify. Make sense? Yes, it does. Perfect. Yep. Um, and all right, good. As we, uh, I mean, we just left two years ago, we had high interest rates. And just about every market, right? Uh, Jim Cramer says there's always, there's a bull market somewhere. You just got to find it. It's something he says or something similar to that. But there's always an opportunity. Two years ago, it was a great opportunity to buy bonds because you could have locked in high yields. And then as, interest rates go down, you're locked in. You're locked in at seven, eight, nine percent, which is a very good rate of return on a bond, which is very low risk. So I took that opportunity to lock in this this bond ladder at a good rate. Uh, going forward, rates are going to drop a little bit. So it's going to get a little more challenging. But for all we know, two years from now, we're going to be back into higher interest rates and it'll give me an opportunity to replenish this bond ladder. All right, perfect. So it's been a, a very good first call, guys. Um, I think we handled some very good topics, starting with, you know, how to look at compounding of of uh, investments, and you know, Tomas, that was an excellent question. I encourage you to keep, you know, stay engaged. Um, you know, the more you communicate with people um, that could help you kind of get one more idea, one more reference point, one much more point of knowledge, the better off you'll be. You know, when I was a youngster, one of the reasons why I would go around collecting information from others is that I, I didn't have a father around. So I had to kind of adopt, well, hey, so-and-so looks like they really got it together. And I put, put myself out there and asked, and every single person was generous with their time. And they really helped me get down you know, a path of investing and, um, and doing well with it and buying real estate. Um, and I would say, you know, continue to stay engaged. If you're young, the biggest investment that you can make that is affordable to everyone is invest in your knowledge, invest in getting better and better and better. And you will wake up with what I think is going to be more money than you're going to need, especially in your retirement years. Scott. Hey, hey, sorry, I'm late. Just wanted to say that. And uh, I'll have to catch the, the rest of the video that I missed when you recorded. I assume you didn't have time to go into the uh, Swiss bank, right? No, no. Maybe we can do that one next week. I think that one's a little bit of an advanced topic, but I've got it ready. So maybe we can handle it next yeah. week. Cool. Yeah, I thought it might be a good challenge, right? Go through everything, including the currency uh, exchange. And... Yeah, I did. <laughs> Intermediate so just, to advanced topic. So a preview to next week's um, session. You know, banks are a different type of company to review on different metrics. And Scott had a um, 
a bank located in Switzerland that he wanted to take a look at. So I did the homework behind it. And um, I was afraid that if we dropped into that as the first workshop, it'd just be kind of jumping ahead five chapters in the book. <laughs> so I think next week we can handle it because we took on a couple of good things like weighted average cost of capital, but we'll go over banks and why the book value is important when we look at a bank, how we look at earnings, how to look at like banks, you truly look at them historically and you get a very good sense of historically, how have they done? And then you rank them against their peers uh, because banks have been around for hundreds of years and they give us the data to do so. And we'll do that next week. That'll be one of the topics. If it, it, and I think it'll be a good one. We'll probably do that topic um, maybe at the 30 minute mark after we can handle a couple easier topics because it is going to be involved. Be ready to feel like you're in an accounting course. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I have a related question actually, something I've been thinking about. Would it make sense to buy Microsoft Office for a home if we're, if we're, if we're all going to be doing serious evaluating? No. Uh, so oh. I, so I've been, so the first spreadsheet package I learned was Lotus one, two, three, that was an independent company. And then I learned Quadco pro and Excel, Excel became the dominant platform or tool. So I used Excel from 1990 until recently. Now I'm on Google sheets, Google sheets in a lot of ways is better and it's free. And I've been able to do everything I need to do from an analysis perspective. And it actually is better because if you look at, uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. It's like it updates, like this is a Google feature. It'll update stock prices for me. When I want to share something with somebody else, it's easier. So the short answer is I bought this computer that you guys can't see because I'm on the other side of it. I bought it two months ago, had it. Uh, custom made for my streaming and stuff. And I had to make a decision, pay $100 a year for uh, out, uh, the Microsoft suite or just use Google. And I've been using Google full time and I'm never going back. <laughs> it's better. It's better than Excel. There's nothing in Excel. There's nothing that I'm missing in Google Sheets. There's nothing I'm missing in Google like uh, presentations or the documents, especially documents, right? Documents are simple. So hopefully I saved you a hundred bucks or you spent a hundred bucks because you like Excel, your decision. I think you may have saved me a hundred bucks. Thank and you. That's a hundred bucks a year. It's not a hundred bucks once. It's a hundred bucks a year. Talking about compounding. If you look at that over the next 20 years, that's like a couple thousand dollars. <laughs> I actually have office through my work on my work laptop on the off chance. I really need it. So that's, thank you. Yeah. That's my situation as well. But uh, that's why I had to like, just, just go for it and go Google sheets and, I'm that much better for it. And what's funny is my 20 and 24 year olds, they've been on Google Sheets, you know, the whatever document manager on Google. They've been on this stuff since they were like in the second grade. And and I'm like, you know, on the learning curve and they're like way ahead of me and they're much younger, which is interesting. Perfect. Well, very good session. Thank you so much for your support of um, my channel. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, keep the comments coming. And uh, let's keep learning. Let's keep learning and um, keep getting better. The market's been great for two years. And I can tell you that in 2022 especially, um, it would have been nice to have others to speak with because 2022 was really rough. You guys remember 2022? Yes, it, I do. The price stocks, like Meta was down like 85%. Uh, I mean, some of the best companies in the world were just getting shellacked. NVIDIA was down 65%. And it would have been nice if we had the community back then. So we could just say, hey, look, stay the course. You know, Manage the things you can manage. Keep manufacturing success. Because the payoff from 2022 is massive. If you bought into Meta, Google Alphabet, Uber, I mean, just go down the list, Netflix, which I showed, you would have double, tripled your money just in less than two years. So not asking for a bear market, but we can keep the community going. The next bear market, I think we'll, we'll be able to sustain it a little better because there, there will be strength in numbers because we could kind of just have contacts to a bear market and say, okay, this is what's not working, but it's temporary. That company's still great, I think. Uh, look at their numbers. Look at their revenue. It's still there. Look at their cash flow. It's still there. Just the market's selling it off. The market's afraid. And um, 
we'll see. We'll see when, when, when it happens. Hopefully, we'll have the community still going and we can uh, lean on each other. So I got some comments here. Yuda, uh, so we went over DCF. So I have a, a video on building a bond ladder, okay? It's not like building a bond ladder is not like, you know, uh, a short-term mission. It's more of a long-term mission, but I could definitely handle that next week in this call. And I'll kind of go through the process of doing that. And then I would say, don't be in a hurry because if you're in a hurry, you're going to make bad investments. Pace yourself. And if anything, just know, because I don't know what your age is. And I don't know if you need a bond ladder now or in 10 years or in 20 years, but just kind of acquire the knowledge and then pace yourself if you decide to do something like that, because it, it might take a couple of years to get the whole thing done. And that way you take a nice you know, uh, approach to buying when the buying's good, getting at the right prices, earning a really good yield, and then sitting on it. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, I was even referring, I think I saw that video, like even more basic, just like where to even find <laughs> bonds. Um, yeah, yeah, because yeah. I had never like kind of gotten into bonds before that. Now, so. you, you know, like, uh, so you're right. You know, <laughs> there's like a million pieces of information for a stock, and then you go to bonds and it's like crickets, like nothing. But the good news is bonds are simpler much easier. They're loans. And some of these companies that you're very familiar with, right? Like you name 20 companies that you're familiar and comfortable with, you can find bonds for those companies. And then you can, you're comfortable with the company. Now you got to go make yourself a good deal, which is, okay, well, if I'm getting that bond, it's going to be a three-year uh, schedule or maturity plan. What kind of rate of return am I going to get? 5%, 7%. Okay. Does that fit what I, the outcome I want? Do I want some of my assets to be really low risk? In bonds, yes um, or no. You know, hey, I want a higher rate of return. Bonds, you know, you could what what they classify as B-rated bonds, which are okay risk. It's not high risk. When you look at the companies in there, these are all very commonly invested companies that I would say stock investors feel is a reasonable risk. So a lot of those bonds are reasonable risk bonds for me, in my opinion. Um, and then there's really really premium bond issuers like j and j apple microsoft those guys are top of the food chain very top is the united states government they issue out debt they pay about four percent that's super risk-free then after that they'll be uh kind of like the top of the food chain and then after that another rung i don't dabble in high risk bonds because i'm going into bonds because i want lower risk i don't go into bonds replicating the risk that i'm taking on stocks so glad to do it. We'll add that to next week's agenda. So next week, we're going to go in, get into a bank. We're going to analyze a bank. And uh, uh, we'll go through all the reasoning and kind of get to an end where we can make a good decision on a bank. Yep. All right, everybody. Good. Thank you. Thanks for attending. I really appreciate it. And enjoy the rest of your weekend. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. you guys. Thank you, Victor. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Victor. Bye, guys.